I'm Dr. Medeiros with Ear, Nose, Throat Consultants, and we're going to talk a little bit today about tubes. Um, so we're going to talk about tubes, we're talking about ear tubes that go into the eardrum. The idea behind these things are that usually there's fluid that either builds up behind the eardrum uh, or there's recurrent infections uh, or there's trouble hearing or there's just that uncomfortable feeling of your ears being full and not being able to pop them. Um, the most common reason would be recurrent infections or persistent fluid behind the eardrums and that certainly affects hearing. The eustachian tube is a normal anatomic structure that goes from the uh, back of the nose uh, to the ears. It's supposed to clear those ears and everybody knows that when they're on a plane they're trying to yawn, trying to chew gum, trying to pop those things. Now when that doesn't work well, and there's a lot of different reasons that doesn't work well in young children, um, plus the fact that they are certainly more susceptible to normal infections of childhood, um, we can have fluid develop in the ears and we can have quite a bit of infection then follow that. Um, in adults, it's a lot less common, and yet it happens. We have plenty of patients who have needed tubes. Uh, essentially, their eustachian tube has proven lifelong that it doesn't want to work well. Uh, typically, it's still um, most indicated in adults who can't uh, either can't seem to keep fluid out of the middle ear or can't seem to keep that ear well aerated. And sometimes we get what's called negative pressure or get that eardrum sucked back in, and that can be problematic for a few reasons. So there are all reasons to do this in adults, and we do sometimes. So when we put a tube in the ear, essentially we're making a tiny little lick in the eardrum. Um, a lot of times if there's fluid back there, we're suctioning it out at the time. And then the tube really is a space holder. So it's a little, just a little bit of a lumen through it to keep that little nick open. Uh, typically they stay in there about nine to 12 months on the smallest set we usually put in children. Um, and they're uh, there essentially to keep uh, that ear full of air, which it's supposed to be, that way that ear can drum can vibrate uh, properly. And then usually, I like to say, the kind of eardrum kicks it out like it's a splinter. So it grows in behind it and kicks it out. So the vast majority of the time, these get uh, kicked out by the eardrum itself. And the vast majority of the time when it does that, it's already healed up behind it. Um, uh, there are times when we think about pulling those out. Typically, it's only after years of having no infections whatsoever. Um, uh, and then every now and again, there's a child that may need to have tubes again because maybe they got them put in at a normal age for a kid, which is anywhere between 9 to 18 months, and a year later when they come out, uh, if they go back to having the same problems, we sometimes have to place them again. Uh, then we start thinking about things besides just the anatomical changes that come with age and all the infections and think about things like the adenoid pad, and that's a whole other conversation, but it's a conversation we often have if we're thinking about tubes again. see them over and over again, we have the option of doing what's called a canal tube, uh, where instead of having to do a tube every so many years and have it kick out and go back to the same problems and do it again, uh, we literally lift up the eardrum a little bit and have just a little notch kind of drilled in the ear canal, the bony ear canal, and there's a tube that goes into that notch and goes around the eardrum. Obviously, then the eardrum can't kick it out, um, and then the hope is that that would stay in for 15, 20 uh, plus years. Obviously, there are reasons sometimes that doesn't last as long as we'd like it to, and it does require some uh, maintenance a couple times a year to make sure we're keeping that tube clear. And then even just old wax and skin doesn't build up right up to the point that it can clog up to the end of it. Uh, but it is a good long-term option for those adults. Well, obviously, the canal tube is an OR one. Uh, that one requires real surgery. And to some degree or another, the rest of them kind of depends on uh, what the ear is looking like and, and the patient. Um, typically, obviously, kids are going to the OR for just about all of them. But obviously, that little silastic tubing that we can cut a length of that's very uh, simple to do in the, in the clinic. Uh, the bobbin tubes can be done in the clinic. I've done triune tubes in the clinic. I've got a couple of T-tubes to go in the clinic. Uh, that, a lot of it has to do with, you know, if that eardrum sucked back, is there room to work between the eardrum and the middle ear? If I can foresee that being uncomfortable, I usually counsel patients that it would be better to do it in the OR. Um, so um, not a whole lot of hard and fast rules on most of the tubes. It ends up being, uh, to some degree, patient preference. If they say that doesn't sound like something I'm going to be sitting still for, and or if we kind of look at this and say whether the eardrum's too scarred up or it's too sucked back, or if we're getting the feeling on our exam that it's going to be difficult for a patient to stay still for that, we often recommend the OR. Uh, typically, it's a short procedure, whether it's in the OR or the clinic, uh, which is sometimes why parents can't believe we're already done with the procedure when they come out to tell them it's over. 
Um, in the clinic, you just say it's five minutes or less to get it numbed up, make that neck suction a little fluid out if we need to and place that tube, um, typically on the order of one to two minutes. Um, it still feels that when we do it in the clinic, uh, we use a little numbing medicine. That, even though we're sucking fluid out of there, sometimes people often do give us an aha moment, like that feels better, I can already tell that's better, I'm already hearing better. But uh, it's still a little bit strange because you have the numbing medicine on there. And then over the next few days, there is that feeling of sometimes the weight of the tube in there. Adults seem to notice that a whole lot more than the kids do. Um, uh, the kids have usually had thicker fluid back there a lot longer before they are seen, so I think they just are happy with the change. Um, uh, children the day of the tubes, if we're doing it in the OR, uh, typically by that evening they're acting like nothing happened. Most of the kind of upset uh, feeling they have right afterwards is because of the anesthesia and um, there is some ouch involved. Um, but typically we're talking about ouch that lasts, you know, on, on a, uh, the length of an hour or so, even for adults. Typically we're not hearing it too much later in the day that they're still feeling the effects of any of the procedure itself. Um, in the near future, I'm going to go off for some training here very soon. There may be the option, especially for people who fall somewhere in between that don't look like they need tubes, uh, adults uh, this is, um, for doing something called eustachian tube inflation, where we try to dilate that tube. There's a balloon technique for that coming out, and I'm going to do some training on that in November. Um, I think it'll be for a very selected subset of patients, but thus far it's looked very promising as well. So for those patients we feel like don't quite need a tube and yet they're really bothered by the eustachian tube dysfunction, we might have something on the horizon also.